Is Najee, Najee Harris's vision a problem for the Steelers? We'll talk about that and projecting the run game, as well as talk about USFL targets the Steelers should be looking for. I'm your host, Chris Carter, the Locked On Steelers podcast. We got Alan Saunders on today. Let's get into it. You are Locked On Steelers, your daily Pittsburgh Steelers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Steelers podcast. I'm your host, Chris Carter, bringing you your daily dose of all things on the Pittsburgh Steelers. As always, you can find this show on your favorite podcasting networks and on YouTube. Like this video if you enjoyed. Subscribe to this YouTube channel to get all of your daily Monday through Friday episodes, as well as our bonus content. We thank you for making the Locked On Steelers podcast your first listen every day because we're your team every day. And today's episode is sponsored by LinkedIn. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified, qualified candidates that you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on NFL. That's linkedin.com slash locked on NFL to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. We've got Alan Saunders back from SteelersNow.com. Alan, it's great to have you as always. I want to talk to you about Najee Harris. And anyone who watches this show knows that I'm higher on Najee Harris than I think that the average Steelers fan is because of his numbers so, so far in, in his career. And when look looking at it, yes, he's had over a thousand yards rushing in both his first two seasons with the Steelers and that, and he's played, he's played in all 17 games, both times, both should be accounted for. He's dealt with injuries for sure, but he's fought through them. And, if you look at it, if you look at his games, he still hasn't averaged over four point yards per carry on a season. Yet. He was 3.9 in 2021 and then 3.8 in 2022. But Alan, you and I have talked about this a lot on our own time, how much the offensive line plays into this, how much Najee plays into this. How much of a problem do you think Najee Harris's a vision has been for him? And how much of a problem do you think it will continue to be with this new offensive line and the growth that he's been able to show? I don't know that his vision has been a big problem. I mean, I think there is something to a running back's ability to um, run as far as the play is blocked, right? And that's like a hard thing to do um, statistically, right? Sometimes you just have to see it. Uh, sometimes the way it looks maybe to a running back, the holes is different – is the way it looks on film. Mm-hmm. But, you know, if a, if a play is blocked where there's three yards of, of green grass, of space for the running back to take, and he's taking less than that, then I think you can say vision is a problem. Um, if, you know, and, and then I think if you look at plays and like, look, there's no, look at the some of those years, some of those plays, you can look at the times that Najee Harris has hit before the line of scrimmage, and you say, well, that was blocked to zero yards, but maybe it was blocked to negative yards, right? Right. Um, and so uh, I think there's there's two problems here, right? One okay. is that the Steelers' offensive line has not been very good. Right. And I think that's impacted Najee Harris negatively, obviously. I think there's also something, too, like Najee Harris has not – gotten over three yards on those three yard block plays, you know, mm. he's, he's, or he's maybe just getting three or he's not quite getting three. And we're also not seeing the kind of plays that skew the average, right? I mean, the running game is all about little chunks, little chunks, little chunks, like don't stay out of negative. That really hurts your average. Right. But one 15 or 20 yard run Can impacts your rushing average for like a half a season. Right. I mean, it takes a lot of threes and twos and ones to add up to 115. And so I think it's like three things. And I don't think the problem with those is necessarily vision. I think Mm -hmm. the problem with those is a combination of blocking and just he's not that explosive in the open field. Right. I mean, he's not a kind of guy that is just going to run away from people. He's more like a bigger back. And so the opportunities for him in those areas are going to be more limited. So I just think it's like sort of all three of those things working in concert against him. He has not had exceptional vision. If you look at, for example, his rushing yards over expectation, um, Mm -hmm. which is an imprecise stat. It's a guess, right? But it's, it's very negative. It's, it's among the worst in the league. Um, So I think there's some vision problems. 
uh, it's clear to anybody that's watched any amount of the Steelers that there's been some offensive line problems, and it's clear that was clear to the Steelers too, considering what they did this offseason and going to get Broderick Jones and and Isaac Samalu and Nate Herbig, and really that was a very clear focus. Darnell Washington, Allen Robinson, more blockers, right? That was a very clear focus for the Steelers this offseason, so they saw that as a problem too. The thing I think we're still really not sure is like, okay, if they fix the offensive line, where can where can Najee Harris go from 3.8 to 3.9? Like, what's a realistic expectation with better blocking? Because, um, you know, better blocking is not going to improve his vision. Better blocking is not going to make him more explosive in the open field. Well, but where where should we expect it to land? I think it's a very interesting question. I'm not sure that there's a good answer for it right now. I mean, I think you can try to guess and, and piece some things together, but I think it's one of the big sort of unsolved parts of this season is – if the Steelers want to run the ball more efficiently, that means a higher yards per carry. How do they go about doing that? I, I think that that, that is a, a tough question here. I, the thing is, I don't think I, I agree with you that Najee Harris is not the guy who's he, he's not Jonathan Taylor, where if he hits a seam, he's gone for 80 yards. Willie but Parker, right? Yeah, like just not, you know, he's obviously not that guy, right? But I think he's a lot closer to what Le'Veon Bell was for the Steelers. Le'Veon Bell didn't hit home runs, but. He hits you at five yards, six yards, seven yards, eight yards, a lot. And he would fall forward and he would be consistent and he would be a problem for you. And he'd also be a good receiving back. And I think that Najee Harris can be all of those things. And if 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 Najee Harris can get to the level that Le'Veon Bell was for the Steelers, it puts this offense in a whole another a whole nother playing field. Now, granted, Le'Veon Bell also ran behind Marquise Pouncey, David DeCastro, Marcus Gilbert, an offensive line that was doing all that work and giving him that space. But I think it's important to remember, like there were games when Richard Mendenhall would struggle and you'd look at the, the late 2000s Steelers offensive line. Meh, it was just wasn't that good. But it, when they started to coalesce, when they started to come together, when they drafted Marquise Pouncey, he had some really good years and, and, um, and, and was able to be a big factor. There. In fact, in Marquise Pouncey's uh, only season, uh, that they well not only season that he played with Mendenhall because he played a couple of years after that but in the, in this in the first in his rookie season Marquise Pouncey when he played uh, that was the only time Rashard Mendenhall got over 1,200 yards he had, had 1,273 and was a huge factor uh, for the Steelers that year um, you know I know I know everyone remembers the fumble that he had uh, in the Super Bowl but he was a huge part of their of their run that year uh, and deserves credit for helping helping him get there and I think that that's something where Najee Harris, there's times where like I, I disagree with the decision he makes in the field, but I, I think that it's not as big of a problem as some people have made it out to be. I think that it's more of a thing where there's times where he makes mistakes, but all running back Derrick Henry misses misses gaps sometimes because he thinks he can shoot some somewhere else. Menage Harris to be the back that the Steelers need him to be needs to be the guy that's that's hitting the hole hard, that's falling forward, and when the offensive line is giving him space, he's turning, he's average, he's getting these five or six yard runs more often and more often. Yeah, and I think you know one of the if you really want to break into the advanced stats here, one of the ways that you can sort of parse that out is that while his rushing yards over expected was the worst in the NFL at negative eighty one the percentage of rushes where he was over expectation versus under expectation was more middle of the road. It was like 38%. It's, mm -hmm. you know, it's not good, but it's, you know, like very similar to Saquon Barkley and Christian yeah. McCaffrey, like guys yeah. we're talking about as pretty good running backs. So I think the big thing is finding ways to get him into the second level where he can break tackles and he can use his strength and speed combination to make bigger plays. And uh, that'll offset some of those, um, if you want to call them deficiencies in, in vision or, or finding the absolute best path forward through the offensive line. Uh, I, I think that goes a long way. I really think that's the key. And I think, you know, one of the things you said, you get yeah, using in the passing game, but I think just sort of changing the the point of attack for him in a lot of ways will make that better um whether that's uh, maybe a little bit of pistol or you know uh moving him out into the slot having him come into motion um those kind of things i think will will go a long way you know i think this is really you know 
a lot of the focus this offseason is going to be on Kenny Pickett, and there's good reasons for that. He's probably the most important player on the team. But I think this is an underrated job for Matt Canada, is finding a way to unlock more of Najee Harris's talent this season. I agree. We'll talk about how they do that and if they do that, what the actual run game's numbers should look like this upcoming season. We'll talk about that and more here on the Locked On Steelers podcast. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. But before we do that, I want to talk to you guys about LinkedIn. LinkedIn, of course, is sponsoring this show, and they're they're here with LinkedIn Jobs, which gives you the opportunity for if you're looking for the for the new for the new hire, this is your chance to to reach out into a great network, find the right people that fit your business, talk to them faster, and forget it for free. You can create a free job post in minutes on LinkedIn Jobs that helps you reach out to your network and beyond, and including the world's largest professional network at LinkedIn that includes over 810 million people. Then you add your job and the purple hashtag hiring frame for your LinkedIn profile to spread the word that you're hiring so that your network can help you find the right people to hire. Simple tools like streaming, streaming questions make it easy to focus on candidates with just the right skills and experience so you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and hire. It's why small businesses rate LinkedIn jobs number one in quality hires versus leading competitors. LinkedIn jobs helps you find the candidates that you want to talk to faster. Did you know that every year, every week, nearly 40 million job seekers Visit LinkedIn, host your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on NFL. That's linkedin.com slash locked on NFL to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. Back here on the Locked On Steelers podcast, I'm your host, Chris Carter, here with Alan Saunders of SteelersNow.com. Alan, so let's let's talk about this for a little bit here about we talked about, you know, one before we get into the overall numbers and what we expect here. What do you expect? What does Matt Canada need to do to put Najee Harris in better situations? Is it as simple as putting him in different spots so that it's harder to predict for predict for the defense for the defense to predict where he is? Because one thing I noticed all year long was when Najee Harris was in the backfield, linebackers and safeties, linebackers first step was always forward. Safeties were either were either also coming up or they were not backing off because they knew that they could not let him get going to and to help the Steelers offense. I mean, I think they've got to prove that they can block them, right? I mean, I yeah. think that's that's sort of job one. Um, if they can do that, that's a really good start because you know then it it starts to take away from things in other areas. We've talked about that before. I think that's really the the golden key for this offense is getting the running game to a point where teams need to focus on it to the detriment of their focus in other areas. Um, I, I do think you know m- different formations moving him around the formation putting him in motion putting him and Jalen Warren on the field at the same time um more two tight end sets especially with like I love Pat Farmuth he is not like an elite run blocker like he's a really good tight end but that is sort of not the thing that he is the best at um so I think a, a tight end in Darnell Washington who um and I and I love Zach Gentry but putting Zach Gentry in the field sort of gives away your intentions most of the time, right? Like he's a guy you're going to throw the ball to five times a season. So a guy like Darnell Washington, who is a better blocker than probably any of those guys and a better receiving threat than a guy like Gentry, I think gives them the ability to go two tight end more. Um, And so I think, you know, two tight end and, and pieces that they can move around. I just think we haven't seen, you know, the, the creativity, from Matt Canada uh, coming through. I really think it's important to get Najee Harris into some better situations. Get him some cheap yards. Um, that is a, a good way to do it. Um, you got to block them, obviously. But if you can find a way to, to run where they aren't, that helps too. And um, I, I think we haven't seen enough of that either. Just been very conservative and very vanilla the last couple of years. And when you don't trust your offensive line, I think that makes sense. But I think that we've got to see uh, some shackles off of this offense and some play calling that that looks a little bit more inspired and a little bit less like he's holding his breath that the five guys aren't going to screw it all up. I think that's that that's part of it is Matt Canada does need to put just just kind of put charge into his offense, be like, hey, you guys are going to go win this win this one today, and. 
Um, I'm not sure we, we, we've really seen that from him. Now, granted, the offense has, hasn't given him a whole lot of reason to really believe in that. But I think that Kenny Pickett at the end of the year showed, showed you we, we've talked about our beliefs in Kenny Pickett. I think that there is potential for that. But I agree with the double tight end look because now you could, if you can come out and the Steelers are a legitimate passing threat and run at the same time and you can work with that and Kenny Pickett balances that, it, that'll create some head, headaches for sure that I know that. Uh, teams will not be looking forward to facing. Um, so I, I'm I'm right with you in that department of of the Steelers and and what they need to do there. But I also think it's it's also just kind of about making sure that they're that you know once those blockers get their job done, they need to also be calling play action keep setting keep setting it up you can't just this can't be a team that just runs the ball they have to be able to run the ball and then work off of running the ball to give to give themselves more opportunities and i think if they do that they put themselves in a great position um to be a uh um a a a stronger offense you know i just i go back and i look at when things were starting to roll in the second half of last year you saw Najee harris doing the things that you know, we kind of saw him do it Alabama a little bit, falling forward, taking the yards that were that, that were there, and, and and being the hard nosed runner. And if he's that guy, it's one, it's a it's a big step for the offense because it'll then open more things up for Kenny Pickett. And if Kenny Pickett is who I think he's going to be, I real I really see this offense taking off. I'm not saying you know being a top ten offense or anything like that, but I think that it they will be, it, it, people will be so refreshed to just see them be a little bit better than middle of the road compared to what they've been the past two, three years. Yeah, I mean, you were talked in the open about getting him over four yards of carry. Well, after the bye last year, he was at 4.1, right? I mean, yeah. that's that's sort of the best we've seen from him. And so I think it makes a lot of sense. And when you're talking about how that looks, you know, for the Steelers as an offense, you know, that difference, oh, like two, two-tenths of a yard per carry doesn't really sound – like that much, the Steelers had 500 carries last year. Um, so a you know a tenth of a yard per carry is an extra 50 yards. So two to, so that's an extra hundred yards a year. So the Steelers last year had 2,073 rushing yards. They were 16th in the league. If they had another 106 rushing yards, that'd have been 11th. Like mm-hmm. that's like that point two is the difference between middle of the road and top third in terms of rushing offenses. So it's not like they are miles and miles away from you know reasonably successful rushing offense. Not that eleventh is like getting them you know crazy credit. That was the Carolina Panthers last year. I don't think anybody thinks about them as some <laughs> kind of elite rushing team. Um, but you know that it just shows that there's. In the running game, that it's all just little bits. So any little bit anywhere you can get uh, makes a big difference. And I think, uh, you know, the, on the one hand, I think things are sort of aligned in a way that I think we should see more out of Najee Harris. On the other hand, uh, are the Steelers overdue for some lack of availability for their number one running back? He has played uh, 35 out of 35 games over two seasons, right? Mm-hmm. So... Uh, I actually think they are in the best shape they've been in quite some time for dealing with a running back injury because I thought Jalen Warren was awesome last yeah. year. He did wear down a little bit down the stretch, to be expected from a guy in his rookie season. But I, you know, I think he really has some juice as a a number two running back that we haven't really seen from them in a in a long time. Maybe since uh, D'Angelo Williams. Like I mean, that's like the last guy I think that you really felt like okay, if there's an injury, like. This is a still a player that the Steelers trust and I think has the ability to get the job done. When we look at the overall projections for this season, what are the numbers that you need to see from this rushing offense to, to, to be satisfied and say, hey, they did a good job this year? Just looking back um, at, at at things and how things have played out, um, the Steelers – uh, the Steelers ha- have had the last time the Steelers had a a a, ru- a rusher get close to 1,300 yards was Le'Veon Bell in 2017 uh, when he had 1,291. Najee Harris in 2021, him getting 1,200 yards made him it was the 13th best rushing season uh, of all time uh, overall for a, for a Steelers running back in just pure rushing yards. Um, now. When I look at that, you know, it, it's also including Jalen Warren, Jalen Warren in this. 
But what are the numbers that you need to see from this rushing offense to say, hey, they did their job and this is actually traject- on, on the right trajectory? Uh, weirdly, I think a better numbers from Kenny Pickett is the answer to that question. I think mm. if like if they if they run the ball well enough that Kenny is freed to play better than he did last year, then I think that's a good answer. You know, so much of how much you run the ball and where your rushing statistics end up is about whether you're winning or losing, right? And so a lot of times there is this sort of false correlation where you know oh good this really good team finished first in the league in rushing and it's not that they've finished their really good team because they were first in the league in rushing they were first in the league in rushing because they were a really good team that was winning all the time and you know i i don't i i think i'm I'm more bullish than most on the steelers this season i think the vegas win total is a load of crap and we've talked about that on, on this podcast before but I'm also not sure that this is a team that is just going to be like running away with games to the point where they're like trying to run out the clock over and over again. That doesn't really seem like their MO to this point. So I'm not sure that we're going to see like gaudy fantasy football totals for Najee Harris. If that's like kind of the angle you're looking at this from, I don't know that we're going to see like a top 10 rushing attack in terms of yards. Uh, But if they run the ball well enough, that they can take some defensive pressure off Kenny Pickett in that passing game, then I think that's doing the job. I hear you. We'll see if that job gets done when we start to get get a closer look at this season, especially how they take on training camp. A lot there's a lot of factors that play into this. But we got to switch topics. I want to get some thoughts on Allen on USFL players the Steelers could be looking at here to add to the training camp roster of who they're bringing to St. Vincent College. We'll do that in just a minute here on the Locked On Steelers podcast. I'm your host Chris Carter. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Back here on the Locked On Steelers podcast, I'm your host, Chris Carter, with Alan Saunders of SteelersNow.com. Alan, I want to ask you about USFL, guys. Now, yesterday on the show, I talked about this briefly. I'll get your thoughts on this, too. Uh, Vince Williams, former Steelers linebacker, tweeted out uh, a video that was, that was shared uh, of Ruben Foster, uh, who uh, was a first-round pick for the 49ers back in 2017, same year that TJ. In fact, the very pick after TJ Watt was, was selected. Um and uh, he was thought to be the next big thing at linebacker. He was gonna. He was coming from Alabama. A lot of people projected him as the best off-ball linebacker. But then he had multiple arrests. He had a lot of problems there. He failed his drug test at the combine. Uh, got into an argument with one of the people that worked there. Got sent home. And then when he got to the got to San Francisco, there were still problems, and it just got worse and worse. Eventually, he, even when he found a new team, he tore his ACL. So now he's in the USFL, but he was making plays and. Uh, Vince Williams was 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 saying he could see him being a Steeler, and immediately everyone that you know it's it's Steelers Twitter, and it's 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 July. We got nothing else better to do. Everyone's like, "Go get him, sign him right now. He's the man." And I was like, "Okay, guys, I hear you." I, Squidward, I, I was Squidward meme. Squidward meme. It's Steeler. <laughs> you you know exactly which which meme we're talking about. But um, uh, but but looking at that, you know, I even I, I said like on on the show yesterday, like, hey, like, listen. There's a lot of baggage with this guy. I'm okay with signing him if the if it's if it's just the, the the deal that you plan to be very cheap and just to be something to just bring him into the camp body to be better than Mark Robinson, Nick Kwiatkowski, um, and, and Tanner Muse and those guys. But if you're signing him and thinking, oh yeah, linebacker solved now, I think you're thinking a little too high there. What's your look at if they were to bring in a Reuben Foster and then we'll get to some other USFL players? Yeah, I mean, I think. From, from everything that I've been told, uh, the sort of off the, the field stuff uh, is something that's, um, you know, there's been some maturing and some growth there. Um, and the knee injury when he was with Washington was pretty significant. And so, you know, he looked healthy. That, that Those are the kind of the bigger two things. Like, the guy was a first-round pick. I, I don't think there's any question that he has talent. Um, if he can stay out of trouble and he can stay healthy, somebody's going to give him a shot. And, you know, yeah, you're talking like, hey, it's July, there's nothing else to talk about. But look, the Steelers have three XFL guys on their roster already. They had a number of guys uh, when AAF folded in 2019 and then again when the XFL folded uh, during the COVID year in 2020. They signed a bunch of these guys. They are taking 
this spring pro football thing seriously as a path to fill their 90 man roster. Not all those guys are going to make impacts on the team, but if you, I mean, there have been guys, uh, Christian Coots played in the XFL, uh, JC Hassenauer played in the AAF, I believe. Uh, Cam Kelly, who was uh, starting safety for a couple weeks, uh, he he was in the AAF. So I mean, the Steelers are taking this seriously as a, as a path for for talent to the to the roster. And so, I mean, I don't I don't discount the idea that a player like Ruben Foster could be signed. I may discount the idea that he's going to be like a starter next week or something like that. But um, I absolutely think that he actually. I think it's more likely than not that he will get signed by an NFL team, whether it's the Steelers or not. I, I don't know. Uh, that'll probably depend on what they think about him as a person. But there are a lot of good options when you look around the USFL in terms of guys that are probably tangentially familiar to Steelers fans um, and just in general. In fact, um, the guy playing right next to him, a linebacker for the Maulers, Kiava Tazino, San Diego State. The Steelers have more San Diego State alums than like the whole rest <laughs> of the NFL put together, I think. So you know they're familiar with this guy. And he had 95 tackles in 10 games playing next to Foster. He had more tackles. He made a couple interceptions. Um, you know, he's only six foot tall, not like a big guy, but he covers pretty well. I, there are a lot of good players in that league. There are a lot of players that are going to get an opportunity. And I would actually be surprised if we don't see the Steelers make a couple moves to bring in some of these guys between now and the start of training camp. I hear you. I wouldn't be surprised either. I want to have a question though, a reasonable one. What would what's the expectations for a USFL player who just played a whole season in his league? Um and, and like if you're Ruben Foster, you played all the way to the championship game, so you're gonna basically get. If, let's say they signed Ruben Foster, or the one of the other, or the other guy, or anyone else that was just in, that, in the championship game. Also, like you know, one of the Birmingham Stallions, you sign that guy uh, th- this week, and basically he has less than a month to get ready for training camp and to heal up. Football is a very physical game, even at that level in the in the USFL. Is that is that too much? Asking too much of a player to play all that season, then just be ready for training camp and get ready to get beat up all over again? I actually think, in some ways, it might be an advantage. I Ooh, mean, okay, you're yeah. you're like think about a guy who has done nothing but you know, okay. If we're talking about guys that aren't on the roster right now, like players that are free agents, okay, would you rather have a guy that just played twelve games, or would you rather have a guy that hasn't played a game? since hasn't done anything since January, right? Like I, to me, I think so, so compared to other players that are available on the free agent market, I think it becomes an advantage for the spring football players that they have experience. And also they just get to play like the guys that are in this sort of roster space where they're not good enough to regularly be on 53 men rosters. If they stay in the NFL and they do the practice squad thing and then the reserve future contract. And then they, you know, they go through another training camp and then they're back on the practice squad. And you can probably think back to like Steelers players through the years that have been stuck in that pattern. In fact, uh, one of them is, was just playing in the USO. Brian Allen was a cornerback from the Steelers. He did that for like three or four years where he was on the team or he was on the practice squad. And he just wasn't doing much, you know, he, like those guys don't get to play. And then the, but the spring football gives them a chance to actually play in games. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you can only develop so much when you're being, you know, TJ Watts practice dummy, right? Like <laughs> going out there and like doing your job in an actual game is so much better uh, place for development than it is, you know, j- just practice or, or, or nothing, which is what a lot of other players that are available have been doing all this time. Where it to me becomes a problem is, is if you're expecting things out of this guy again this January, right? right? If you're talking about playing 12 games, then going straight into training camp, then going straight into a preseason, then going straight into an eight week, 18 week season, like, okay, that's a lot. That that, that this is this is becoming more than than is reasonable to expect a guy, which is why I don't think you're going to see anybody come out of this league and get thrust into some kind of big role. It'll be a part-time thing. It'll be a practice squad thing. It'll be a, a backup thing. And then, look, maybe things happen, and maybe they get a bigger role along the way, like those guys that I mentioned before that did this for the Steelers. But I do think that when talking about like day one of training camp, 
heck yeah, give me the guy that just played 12 games. Like, I think he's in a better position to make an impact at that moment than someone who's just been sitting around for these five weeks. I hear you on that. And, and one thing I think that also could be factored in, I mean, you know, back in, back in the day, training camp used to be ridiculously long, like in the 70s. I mean, it and was. And two, two a days, full pads, full contact, every single right. one of them. And here's the thing is that like those guys took a lot more beatings and there was a lot more things that they had to worry about later in their lives. And that's why football is different today in, in what, in what uh, players are allowed to do because they're trying to make it so that their more football players can, can have healthier, healthier lives after the game. Uh, so that's part of that problem there. But, you know, I I'm with you on that. It might not be as big of a, big of an issue. And it might even help them as far as training camp and in, in earlier parts of the season. Um, but I think it's like kind of like what you said too. It's like don't be, don't look at these guys as the potential saviors. Don't look at these guys as the players who are going to come in and just fix everything. These are these are guys who can be puzzle pieces that can fit in on the bottom end of a, of a roster and help you and help you maybe have some depth options where if you go through what you went through with the Buccaneers when like the Steelers' entire secondary was decimated, you could have a guy step up in that moment. Those are the guys that you're looking for from the USFL right now. Yep. I'll, uh, I wrote a story at SteelersNow.com. You can check it out. Well, I listed four guys, and I'll, I'll run them down and like throw out a couple other names I know Steelers fans are familiar with. Um, West Hills is a running back. From, he was uh, played one year at Slippery Rock, and he's a big dude. I think if you look at the Steelers, like number three, four running back options, it's all little guys. West Hills led the USFL in rushing, and he's a big, strong, physical guy. If you're looking to put like a true backup to Najee Harris – and Jalen Warren on the practice squad, he could be a fit. Chris Orr is a linebacker from the New Jersey Generals, played at Wisconsin with uh, Keanu Benton, Nick Herbig, Isaiah Loudermilk, Joe Schobert, and TJ Watt. So a um, lot of Steelers. I, I think the Steelers are pretty familiar with his game. Another really good cover linebacker, something I think we've talked about roughly 747 times on this podcast over the years. 748 uh, tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Breland Speaks is probably a player whose name is familiar to you. Was a second round pick of the Chiefs in 2018. Very talented edge rusher uh, that was uh, had a substance abuse violation and kind of uh, had things fall apart for him, but had a very strong season, nine sacks in 10 games in the USFL. And a couple former Steelers had really big years too. Deion Kane, wide receiver out of Clemson, played for the Steelers in 19 and 20. He was the championship game MVP, got four catches, three touchdowns, including the game sealer. And Marcus Gilbert, cornerback with Al Cooper Roots, was with the Steelers the last two seasons. He led the league in interceptions and was part of that number one defense with the Maulers. There are certainly a lot of guys out there. That's just a couple names, but ones that I think are familiar to the Steelers and Steelers fans. Absolutely. Do check out that piece at SteelersNow.com. It'll get you all the insight and more that Alan just explained here. Alan, thanks so much for joining us on the Locked on Steelers podcast. Let people know they can find you, follow you, and get more of your work. Yeah, at A. Saunders underscore PGH on Twitter, at PGH Steelers now is the site's Twitter, as long as Twitter still works. If it doesn't, like, just go to the website, SteelersNow.com. You can... You can snail mail me, I guess. I don't know. I don't know what we're doing. Uh, you can find me here on the Locked On Steelers podcast, usually every Monday or Tuesday. Absolutely. We'll, we'd love to have you back again next week talking all things Steelers. He's Alan Saunders of SteelersNow.com. Check out all their great work. And you can find me, your host, Chris Carter, on Twitter and Instagram at Carter Critiques. Also work on some more platforms because don't look good for Twitter. Uh, but uh, you can you can find me there at Carter Critiques. I'll try to keep that name wherever I go. And you can also read my work at the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. Also check out the North Shore Drive podcast that I do there Monday, Wednesday, and Friday on all things Pittsburgh sports. You can also find this show, the Locked On Steelers podcast, Monday through Friday, every day, breaking things down on your Pittsburgh Steelers on your favorite podcasting apps and on YouTube. Like this video if you enjoy it. Subscribe to this channel for all those daily episodes and our bonus content. We're back tomorrow with more Pittsburgh Steelers right here on the Locked On Steelers podcast.